Welcome to the Amphenol Broadband Solutions Cable 101 training series. In this video, we'll cover bonding, grounding, and electrical safety. We'll explain electrical definitions, discuss the National Electrical Safety Code and the National Electrical Code, and how they relate to cable TV, show proper bonding and grounding techniques for residential and mobile homes, and we'll talk about electrical safety as it relates to cable TV. Before we look at electrical definitions, remember this important safety tip. If it isn't grounded, it isn't dead. Unless it is verified, consider all conductors to be energized. We'll also cover additional safety items later in the video. Ground is a potential in this earth. It doesn't mean it is zero voltage and no current. A bond is a physical attachment to power or telco grounds. In cable TV plant construction, we still put in grounds but only on rare occasions when working on residential properties. These circumstances will be shown later. We've always been told that the path of least resistance carries the voltage and current. This is false. They seek all paths to ground, with the majority of it on the path of least resistance. Why do we bond and ground? It's to protect ourselves from electrical shock or from damage to property and equipment. The bonding ground provides a low impedance path or fault current back to the source and reduces potential differences between equipment and minimizes the potential to earth ground. The National Electrical Safety Code, NESC, is a set of safety regulations and procedures issued by ANSI, the American National Standards Institute. It sets guidelines for practical safeguarding of persons during the installation operation and maintenance of electrical supply and communication lines and their associated equipment. As with the NEC, which we'll cover next, they're not laws and the NESC does no enforcement. Enforcement is based on the acceptance by state, county, and local authorities. In most cases, NESC standards are the minimum adopted rules. Next we'll look at the National Electrical Code, NEC. The purpose of the NEC is the practical safeguarding of persons and properties from hazards arising from the use of electricity. As with the NESC, the NEC is not a set of laws but a guideline of practices issued by the National Fire Protection Association. As guidelines, they can only be enforced if adopted by your state, county, or town. Check with your local electrical inspector to see if they adopted the NEC and to see if they have more stringent guidelines than set forth in the NEC. The NEC is updated every three years. Some municipalities may still be enforcing the earlier versions of the NEC. Article 820 of the NEC sets the guidelines for cable TV. Let's look at some of them. Ground wires should not exceed 20 feet. If it can't be done, an 8-foot ground rod can be used, but this must be bonded to the power ground with the number 6 gauge wire. This is when a cable TV company would drive a ground rod on a residential or mobile home, but only on rare occasions. We'll show seven different bonding options later, and one of them should enable a ground wire of less than 20 feet. Ground wire can be insulated or bare, solid or stranded. For RG59, use a 14 gauge wire. For RG6, use a 12 gauge wire. For RG11, use a 10 gauge wire. While the NEC states the minimum gauge wire to be used, check with your company's installation standards to see if their requirements are more stringent or if the wire needs to be solid or insulated. Here I'm showing the ampacity, which is the current carrying capability of the copper bonding wires and coaxial cables. The bond wire needs to have more capacity than cable TV wire. The ground wire must be as straight as possible. Be sure to use gradual bends. Never loosen or move another company's bond or ground attachment. Shock, electrocution, fire, or equipment damage could result. Do not over tighten the bonding screw. It could weaken or damage the bonding wire. A good rule of thumb is tighten until you feel resistance and then another quarter turn. Also make sure that the conductor is free of corrosion at the point of contact. Use emery cloth to clean rather than scraping with a knife. If using wire strippers or knives on insulated wire, do not nick the conductor. 
Over time, with temperature fluctuations, this becomes a weak point. Next, we'll look at seven bonding options. Option one is the best option for bonding. The drop is bonded to the structure's external electrical service number six gauge wire solid copper stub if supplied at the meter panel using an approved conductor and bonding clamp. Make sure it is free of corrosion and do not move other bonds so they make room for yours. If there is no room, then go to one of the other bonding options. Option number two. Often there is more than one utility bonding at the meter panel. In this case, Attached to an open location on a bus bar, also called a grounding bridge if available. In option number three, the drop is bonded to the power company ground conductor or ground wire. This is usually a number six gauge copper wire conductor that runs from the main power panel to the ground rod. Using an approved parallel or vice type clamp that will not damage the ground wire to attach it. Make sure the contact point is free of corrosion. Also, visually ensure that the wire you are attaching to actually makes contact with the ground rod or grounding electrode. In option number four, if the grounding conductor or ground wire is not accessible, the drop can be bonded directly to the power company grounding electrode or ground rod. A separate approved clamp must be used. Never loosen or disturb the power grounding clamp and do not use their clamp to install the ground wire to make room for yours. With option number five, the drop is bonded to the grounded metal conduit of the power mast or the continuous metal conduit between the power meter and the circuit breaker cabinet using an approved bonding strap. If attaching to the conduit on the home side of the meter panel, make sure the conduit is metal and is continuous to the circuit panel box. Use the proper clamp that is manufactured for copper contact on one side and galvanized pipe on the other side. Galvanized to galvanized. No dissimilar metals to be used. Again, make sure the contact point is clean of corrosion and paint prior to attaching the strap. The power mask cannot be used as a drop attachment to gain height over driveways, sidewalks, or streets. Also, it's a good practice to add a do not remove tag. Always follow your company's installation practices. With option number six, the drop is bonded to the metallic meter cabinet using an approved clamp. The attachment must not be made to the door or other movable components of the cabinet. Before you use this option, make sure it is approved by the local power company and electrical inspector. Many power companies don't allow this. Clamps put on improperly block access to opening the meter box and set screws can remove the enamel coating and allow rust to form. On option number seven, the drop is bonded to a grounded interior cold water pipe using an approved clamp. This must be done within 5 feet of the pipe entering the home and only if there's 10 feet of pipe directly in contact with the ground before entering the structure. Before doing this, you need to verify that there is 25 ohms or less of resistance to a ground in the house. If a water meter is present, use approved straps and a number 6 gauge wire to jump across the meter. Many cable TV companies no longer allow this practice. It's too hard to verify that there's 10 feet of pipe in the ground outside the home. Also, water meters have neoprene bushings, so a number six copper jumper would need to be installed to ensure continuity to the pipe in the ground side. Never bond to a black pipe, which is gas, or to an external cold water faucet. With mobile homes, if the power service equipment is within 30 feet of the structure, follow in order the previous listed options as used for a permanent structure. Refer to local codes for their preferences. Follow residential home bonding procedures if possible. If not, here are other options. If the tap pedestal is co-located with the power pedestal and is within 30 feet of the mobile home, it's permissible but not preferred to bond to the tap. Another option, if unavailable to bond like a permanent residence, if the power service equipment is more than 30 feet from the mobile home, use an approved clamp and a number six gauge ground wire to bond to a grounded metal I-beam under the structure. Here's a safety tip. 
Prior to touching a mobile home, use your foreign voltage detector. Mobile home parks are notorious for having poor grounding systems, and often you can be a better ground than the park is providing. Next we'll look at electrical safety. Voltage pretty much gets your attention. Current is what hurts you. You can have voltage without current, but not current without voltage. Voltage is like water behind a faucet. No current until you open the valve to allow it to flow. Let's look at the difference between being shocked and being electrocuted. Shocked, you have been bit. One milliamp is perceptible, which is only one thousandth of an amp. How do you check 9 volt batteries? Do you use your tongue, which is very sensitive? Putting a finger across does nothing, as the outer two layers of skin have no nerve endings. Electrocuted means you're dead. There are many things that can cause things to become energized. Induction, which is close proximity to something, especially if you're parallel. You should maintain 12 inches from power secondaries when parallel in a home or a pole. Friction, accidental energization, down wires, car pole accidents, storms, power lines contacting branches, lightning, and missing power companies vertical risers on a pole. Always visually inspect the power company vertical riser for breaks or missing wire from theft. This wire bleeds inductive voltage from the pole near the primary power lines. If missing near the bottom, the wire above will be energized and waiting for you to become the ground. To protect yourself against electrical hazards, there are several pieces of personal protective equipment that can be used. A foreign voltage detector indicates if voltage is present. It does not detect current. The amp clamp measures current flow through a wire and can be used at a tap, ground block, and inside the home. A volt ohmmeter can be used to measure voltage, current, and resistance. A polarity tester can be used at the outlets before plugging in CPE to ensure that the outlet is wired correctly and there is no difference or potential which can cause a shock hazard. High voltage gloves, if properly tested and certified, can be used when hanging strand. High voltage gloves give a false sense of safety. Unless you are sure they are good, never touch a power utility wire with them. Many primary lines are above the rating of a high voltage glove. Always follow your company's safety policy. In addition to personal protective equipment, when you're inspecting your wires, always pay attention to your senses. Visually, look for discolored and deformed cable TV equipment and broken power neutrals. Smell for burnt odors. With hearing, listen for arcing, hissing, and buzzing. Here are some additional safety tips. Always treat cables and connections as being hot. Handle the drop wire by the installation. Stay on your feet when possible. If kneeling is required, protect yourself with knee pads or a rubber mat. Always disconnect the connector using one hand. Don't be holding the strand, tap, or bonding block with the other hand while taking it apart. If there is voltage or current, you can become part of the circuit. The best advice is to attach your bonding wire first, then always flick the F connector before attaching it. Hold the cable by the jacket and touch the outside of the connector to the bonding block, tap, or strand. A little spark indicates a small amount of voltage and current is present, and this is normal, usually 0.2 amps to 1 amp. With one hand, insert the connector and tighten one or two threads until contact is made. If during the flick it arc welds, stop! If installing an EMTA, take the phone off the hook and connect the EMTA last to prevent getting shocked from the ring voltage current. Let's look to see if it is normal for current and voltage to be on a cable drop. Here we're showing a typical cable installation on a house with a normal 100 amp service panel, which has three secondary power wires. The secondary power wires will be either triplex or open. With triplex, the two black hot wires are wrapped around the bare neutral wire. Do not touch the black wires. They have tree guard, 
not insulation. Touch them and you could get shocked. With an open secondary, the wires are separated and run parallel to each other where the two copper hot wires are outer and the bare neutral wire is in the middle. When you measure voltage between the hot to hot, it would be 220 volts. Between neutral to either hot, you would measure 110 volts. The neutral wire carries the unbalanced current load from the house to the transformer, which is the source. It's the difference between the current load carried on the two hot wires. This can be a very high amperage. Have you ever been shocked handling a drop? Let's look at why this is. Our drop is a parallel circuit to the power neutral. A percentage of the unbalanced load from the circuit panel travels back to the street on the cable TV drop. Current flows from the field side of the bonding block to the transformer. The bond wire carries the same amount of current as the drop. The drop carries less current than the neutral because it has a higher resistance than the neutral. If the neutral fails, it all goes down our drop's braid and foil. On the drop, the braid and foil are the ground. The foil also provides high frequency shielding and the braid provides low frequency shielding. When current starts to flow through a drop after a power neutral goes bad, these photos are what happens. As current increases on the drop, the dielectric begins to melt first. The center conductor moves and you lose the 75 ohm impedance and the picture quality suffers and ultimately the center conductor shorts out to the foil and a service call is generated. Until the jacket starts to melt, there is no indication to the casual observer that there is a problem. When the braid and foil are gone, so is the path from the house to the transformer for the unbalanced current load and bad things can happen in the house. Shock hazards and burns can occur when handling and disconnecting a drop with excessive current flow. If everything is bonded properly, there will be 0.2 amps to 1 amp of current on the drop from the field side of the bonding block to the street. This is normal. That's why you may have been shocked while handling a drop. If the shock comes from the house side of the bonding block, it's usually an inductive voltage and a bad power supply in a piece of equipment. If you take a voltmeter and measure voltage on the house side center conductor, it usually indicates a power supply issue and it could be up to 110 volts. If you measure low voltage, it is more than likely induction being picked up by close proximity to power lines in the house running parallel. If you have a clamp on ammeter, Put it on the drop before disconnecting and measure the current. Measure for a bit to see if the power neutral is intermittent if the wind is blowing. One amp or less is okay. If more, do not disconnect. If you do disconnect the drop and the customer says my lights went out, don't attempt to reconnect the drop. Follow your company policy. If you don't have an ammeter, Ask the customer if their lights have been flickering or changing intensely, especially after a storm. It's a good indication of a faulty power neutral, and you should stay away until further testing is done. So it's normal to have from 200 milliamps up to 1 amp on a drop. At 80 to 120 milliamps, the heart can be affected. A standard 100 watt light bulb draws 850 milliamps. Grounding does not protect you from a lightning strike. If you hear thunder, lightning has happened. How do you tell the distance from the strike location? Count the seconds until you hear the thunder. Most of us were taught that a second equals a mile. This is wrong. Five seconds equals one mile. The speed of sound at sea level is 1,100 feet per second. Lightning can strike from up to 10 miles from a thundercloud. Again, grounding does not protect you from a lightning strike. Let's review what we've covered in this training session on bonding, grounding, and electrical safety. We explained electrical definitions. We reviewed the National Electrical Safety Code and the National Electrical Code. Explained bonding and grounding options and reviewed electrical safety.
Thank you for viewing this training on bonding, grounding, and electrical safety. For additional training topics, see our website at www.amphenolbroadband.com.